As we wait for the official announcement regarding Notre Dame's hire of Joe Rudolph as its next offensive line coach, I want to know, what are the most important qualities in a great college offensive line coach? What can Rudolph bring to the room that someone already in the program can't? And what is it about Joe Wall and Blake Fisher that makes them such special players? I'll discuss all of that and more with a former Notre Dame offensive lineman coming up next on Locked on Irish. You are Locked on Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Irish. Thank you for making this your first listen today and every day. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're listening to the pod, please rate, review, and subscribe. I know I probably sound like a broken record already, but we're starting from scratch here and I've got a long way to go. You know the deal. Rate the show five stars if you like it. Pound sand if you don't. Subscribe and flex your writing skills by writing a fun review. If you're watching on YouTube, same deal. Like the video below, subscribe to the channel. My name is Tyler Wojak, and I am the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018. I've been podcasting about the football team since the 2020 season, and I'm also a producer for the college football talent at Fox Sports. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. In a moment here, I'm going to be joined by former Notre Dame offensive lineman Sam Bush to talk about Joe Rudolph, who, by all accounts, will be officially announced as Notre Dame's next offensive line coach in the coming days or weeks. Sam was a preferred walk-on at Notre Dame and played guard from 2014 through 2017. And I always love love talking to guys who play the position at the college or pro, pro level because I feel like I just learn so much every single time. I feel like we as fans, we all understand how crucial the offensive line is to the success or failure of any team, but it's a pretty difficult position to fully understand unless you actually played it. So I'm grateful to have Sam on to talk about the new hire and also the guys in the roster like Joe Alt, Blake Fisher, and learn more about what makes them so good. Plus, he's got some great stories about Matt Bayless, the lead strength and conditioning coordinator, or I think his correct title is director of football performance at Notre Dame. So I really enjoyed it, and I hope you guys do too. Let's talk to Sam. All right, I'm very excited to be joined now by former Notre Dame offensive lineman and a great friend, Sam Bush. How are you doing, brother? I'm good, man. I appreciate you having me on the show. I'm excited to talk a little Notre Dame football, man. All right, man. Let's talk some Notre Dame football. Give me your thoughts on the hire of Joe Rudolph as Notre Dame's next offensive line coach. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to take an opportunity to just give a huge, uh, huge thank you from me to Coach Harry Heastan as someone who was able to play for him um, and see the way that he goes about his business on a day-to-day um, aspect. Uh, there are few coaches in college football, but really just in football alone. And you could expand that to any sport that do it the way that he does. So Coach Stan, thank you so much, man. I hope you enjoy the hell out of retirement. You deserve every minute of it. Um, Hiring Coach Rudolph. I'm really excited about this. Uh, I love the experience that we're bringing in. I really love uh, the mentality that he's bringing from um, Wisconsin and Virginia Tech most recently. But it, it just seems like very much a fit for the kind of physical football that we want to play you know, this guy has the right mindset based on his previous track record. And it seems like something that's going to be a pretty seamless mesh once he gets into, once he gets into our room, man. So you're obviously a, he stand disciple and he has it. He does his own way. He's a very old school coach. Now that's not to say it's the only way, but there's a reason why he's so good. It does seem like Rudolph kind of fits in that old school mold, but big picture. This isn't even really specific to Rudolph. What are the most important qualities in a great college offensive line coach? Um, I mean, I I really think it comes down to one thing, um, and that's consistency. And that's what I saw from Coach Eastan day in, day out. Every time we would come into the practice room, every time we would step onto the field, is it's the same thing that he demanded from us. It's being the same guy day in, day out, whatever's going on in your life, being able to compartmentalize that and do what you need to do for your team and to be the best football player that you can be. It was never about being the best in the country or being, you know, the best in a room or anything like that. Everything that is preached from my experience with coach, Stan was about being the best you that you could possibly be. And again, that just all stems from the consistency and watching him just come in, be the same guy every day, just go about his business and understand taking care of the little things so that the big things will take care of themselves, I think is, such an indescribable part of what makes a great college offensive line coach. Yeah. And it seems like 
Rudolph was a model of consistency while he was at Wisconsin. We like to call Notre Dame offensive line you because it is, but I think of all the programs <laughs> out there who were to contend, I think Wisconsin is certainly one of them. Now, Notre Dame is obviously bringing in an outside guy, and we hear a lot about the culture of the Notre Dame football program, but within that, there is a uniqueness to the offensive line room that I've heard you talk about a lot and so many other guys who have played. Mike McGlinchey talks about it all the time. Harry Heastan is a huge reason why that is. And now Freeman is bringing in a guy from the outside to lead that room. What do you think are some of the pros and cons to making an outside hire at that position? Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, I'll start with some of the cons um, just because I, I think that the pros, I, you know, I'll start with some of the cons, not to necessarily ramble on that, but I think um, it, it's, it's a shame. It's a change up. And the guys in that room now are going to have to just, adjust to a different way of doing things. And that's not to say that their mentality and um, the work that they're putting in on a day-to-day basis isn't going to change, but they're going to have to get used to a different personality, a different guy telling them, uh, giving them advice and coaching them up in film. And it's just going to be, I think, a bit of a learning process for not only the players coming to form a relationship with Coach Rudolph, but also, you know, that's a two-way street. And Coach Rudolph is going to need to come in and really prove himself to Notre Dame and to the Notre Dame offensive line. And that's obviously, as we've discussed several times on and off podcast, man, the Notre Dame offensive line is such a unique position and such just a unique place to play offensive line in that it's so cohesive. It is so tight. And there is such a standard of excellence that we have fostered there. Um, Nobody is going to just walk in and earn the respect of those guys. It's got to be earned. On the other hand, uh, for pros, we've got a pretty young, we've got a really young offensive line room. We've got guys who um, have seen a change in leadership with Kelly to Freeman, um, and ha- there there are guys in that room who have also seen a change in offensive line coaches from uh, Coach Quinn a couple years to yeah, Coach third and, third and three years. Yeah, third and three years. So there is a bit of excitement that always comes with new fresh blood. And I think not getting so hung up on that and really letting that anxiety, if you will, fuel them and really just kind of let them run with that instead of making them timid. I think that's such a great thing for the guys. So, Yeah, and don't get me wrong. He stand is a legend, but he did come out of retirement for this job. You know what I mean? Like it's hard for me to imagine that the same hunger is there when he, he'd already seen the other side, right? Like he had been retired and he came back. Whereas Rudolph's in a position where I think he's really hungry. I mean, he was at Wisconsin. He did a lot of great things there last year, Virginia tech. It did not go well. Now I think there's a myriad of reasons why Mm -hmm. some of it is probably his fault, but I think a lot of it had to do with the personnel at Virginia tech. So now he gets this great opportunity at Notre Dame and I don't think he's going to be around for just a couple of years. You know what I mean? I think he's going to be around for a long time. So that's something that excites me when, you know, like you mentioned, the coach has to earn the respect of the players. I'm sure that's exciting to do, especially at Notre Dame. Yeah. He's got two, tackles who are going to be future NFL starters. So I, I see that, but I do think that the pros here kind of outweigh the cons. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think you're so right in that, um, you know, with, with Harry, he did come out of retirement. He did come back because um, there was still a place on that team for him. And it was, there were still guys of his in that room who he had recruited. So there was a familiarity with getting back in there and just being the leader of that group of men. Um, but, you know, for the reasons that he stated, I think it's it, Harry decided it's time to go spend time with his family, which is something that only most of us can hope for at that stage in our lives. So seeing Rudolph come in after, like you said, coming off a, a situation that didn't work so well in his favor after the success that he has had and the reputation that he has garnered, it's going to be really exciting to watch him just go about his business in the coming year and hopefully in the coming years. Yeah, when when he stayed retired, I was disappointed at first, obviously, but I did get a laugh. I was like, Harry was probably so sick of trying to kiss up to some 16-year-old. <laughs> I'm not saying he was a bad recruiter at all because he, he, he recruited a lot of great players to Notre Dame. It's more so the act of recruiting that I have no doubt he hated, and I never met him. I, I don't think you're necessarily wrong in that. I couldn't speak to it from his point of view, um, but, you know, Harry – Here's a football coach and he stand wants to coach football. He wants to be around guys who want to play football 
And a part of that job is you got to go out and find those guys. But I think when it comes down to it, he would rather be um, watching film, yeah. picking apart game tape, getting a, getting a game plan ready and just setting up his guys to have the most success on the field. And you know what? I, I totally get it. We'll be right back with Sam, but I wanted to take a moment to tell you about FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to points scored and threes made. If you want my totally unbiased best bet of the night, Give me the Cavs' money line against the Celtics. Jason Tatum has been ice cold as of late, and the Cavs need to get a statement win here in the second half before the playoffs. They came up short against the Nuggets and 76ers recently, but I think they'll get it done tonight in Boston. And if you want a better player prop, take the over on Evan Mobley's point scored. He's been terrific lately. FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss a chance to get your first no-sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on that's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more make every moment more with fanduel an official sports betting partner of the nba okay now back to my conversation with sam let's talk about the guys on the roster here because we mentioned them a little bit already but joe wall okay so look i think i understand football pretty well I know Joe Alt is really good. I have enough understanding of offensive line play to get that part figured out. I mean, for one, he's massive. I think he's 6'8", 315 pounds. But I know there's so much more to his game that I'm not seeing. So what is so special about him, and what separates him from the rest of the great tackles in college football? Because we're talking about a first-team All-American here. And, and we're talking about a first-team All-American as a sophomore, man. Which I is mean, crazy. Which is yeah. absolutely crazy. First-team AP All-American. Um, so give him his flowers when they're due. Um, but I think, you know, this is, it almost feels like a cliche answer to say, but it's the intangibles. And really when it comes down to it, it's, I, I hate to reuse this word, but it is the consistency. Like we saw Harry using the, in his coaching staff and in his coaching room, we're seeing Joe translate that onto the field. And just the way that he is, always stays present in the moment. It feels like when you watch him play, he's not taking plays off. He's very much giving himself into whatever position that he needs to go. And it's all right. You make a bad play, shake it off, get back to the huddle, go about your business and do it again. You make a great play. Good. Let's go get another one. Turn it right back around. Do it again. I mean, you know, I, I got to watch Quentin Nelson, Mike McGlinchey, Mustafer, um, all those guys, I, I got to watch those guys go about their business at the highest level my senior year and see the way that they would do it. And it's just this unspoken confidence where you don't need to say how good you are, what you want to do, uh, and what you're going to do. It's just a fact of doing it and being consistent, relying on your fundamentals and just trusting that your coaching is going to get you to the place that you need to be. Yeah, I guess part of this might have to do with the fact that, like, when Quentin Nelson was dominating, he was like a human highlight tape as a guard, which is insane. <laughs> I mean, there's that one clip that went viral when he laid out the safety from Georgia who got in on the blitz. Incredible. Like, I can watch Quentin Nelson be like, oh, yeah, like, that guy is scary good. If we were to look at Joe Wall here, his physical comp has got to be Mike McGlinchey because they're both enormous. They're both giants, right? But, like, when you do you see a lot of comparisons in their style of play, not just their stature and the fact that they play the same position? Um, you know what? I don't know Joe enough to be able to say that, and I don't want to necessarily speak to his personality. I have I've always been more in his game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And game, yeah. and I have I've always seen, you know, Mike is uh Mike's an explosive player, Mike's a very fluid player, and Mike's able to move around and get himself in the position that he that he needs to. Uh Joe, I've always kind of noticed as a little, little bit more of the unnoticeable guy in that he's not the one he's just always going about it. He's just always doing his job. Yeah. And I think that's all that you can ask for him. Your left tackle is he's getting his job done. He knows his assignment and he's doing it at the utmost highest level, you know, where he's yeah. not going to have, he hasn't had those laying out the safety from Georgia type plays that we've seen, but that's not to say that those plays aren't happening in his game. 
Yeah, maybe it's the most offensive line thing ever to just be so consistent and make so few mistakes that he never really pops up on a highlight tape because he's not really supposed to, right? He just doesn't make mistakes. He does his job, and he excels at it. That's why he's first-team All-American. Now I want to switch to the other side of the line, Blake Fisher. Blake Fisher came in with a ton of hype for good reason. I mean, he was going to start as a true freshman mm-hmm. on the offensive line. That's that's nuts. Now, he he moves to right tackle last year, and he plays last year full season. What did you see from him last year that impressed you the most? I just saw a willingness to help his team and a willingness to do whatever he needs to to make the football team better. And, you know, a lot of guys, um, not that I've necessarily played with, definitely not at Notre Dame, but a lot of guys could have taken that move as a bit of a slight towards them. And the fact that they're not playing left tackle – could be taken as a very personal dig and whatnot. And that's not what we saw with Blake last year. It obviously took our offensive line a couple games to get rolling and really get into their rhythm. But once they did, you saw the cohesiveness of that unit. And that spawns from every five, one of those individual guys buying in and just dedicating themselves to their position and to their craft. And so I think it speaks the world to Blake that he was able to take that in stride, understand that, He's best suited, uh, at least in that version of the offensive line, he was best suited to be that right tackle. And that was the best place that he was going to help the team win. And to see him suck up his pride and just go about doing whatever he needed to do to make the team better, I think that speaks volumes about the kid. How difficult is that move, moving from left side to right side of tackle? I know you were a guard, but still. I, yeah, I was a, I was a guard. I played uh, played tackle in high school, and I I did a bit of swapping from here and there. Um, I really think it's it's a bit more of a mental thing, if I'm being honest. Like all these guys have the physical uh, abilities to really play any position that they would want to on the offensive line. So it's really just getting yourself in the mindset of all right, I'm on a different side. Understanding that when I was on the left tackle side. A certain play call, I know I've got a, I, I know like on the backside of power, I've got a hinge and kick out the end. But, you know, that same play, now that I'm on the right side, it's more of just a mental thing, understanding, all right, I got to flip my brain, flip the orientation of what I'm doing and just understand my assignment from the other side of the ball. It's not that ne- anything is necessarily different. It's just kind of letting your brain catch up to understanding, all right, I'm doing this at a different, at a different angle almost. Right. I I understand that part. And you mentioned a point that I want to bring up here because we hear it a lot and I think we've just come to accept it without really understanding why we being like, uh, you know, your casual football fan or diehard football fan who just doesn't understand offensive line play to its fullest extent. We hear a lot about how it takes an offensive line, a couple games to really gel as a unit and play at a high level. I remember Liam Eikenberg talking about that in 2020, when Notre Dame's offensive line was dominant. And then you watch that Duke game in the season opener and, from that game to like the Clemson game later in the year, it's like two totally different units with the same players and guys who've actually played together before. So I understand the basics of it. Like I get that every offensive lineman is working in tandem with the person next to them, but could you elaborate more on why it takes just more reps to fully gel as a complete five man unit? Yeah. And I mean, I think that last part of your sentence there is almost the encapsulation of what it is. Um, It's, it's a five man unit and it's really the only position in all of sports um, where you need to have five guys working together in perfect synergy to make something good happen. You know, Um, defensive line, I have nothing but the utmost respect for those guys, but you can have in a four man, in a four man front, you can have three guys get their asses blocked And one guy make the play of his life and it's a sack and the defense looks great because of that. But you have one chink in the armor uh, on an offensive line and it's going to be exposed. So you can do practice reps all day long. You can go against the scout defense all day long. You can go one-on-ones versus the one defense of your own team all day long. But really until you get to put on that game helmet and get out there in a game situation it's it's never going to be the same. You're never going to be able to replicate that. You'll never be able to replicate the nerves that you have just playing in those first few games of the season and having to shake off that rust. And there just is this um, fluidity that you guys need to develop and kind of this unspoken, uh, again, I use the word synergy, where it takes a couple games. And, you know, first game of the season, you may see something that gets you, but you see something 
fourth or fifth game of the season, that's exactly the same deal. You guys have all worked through that. You've seen it in film. You've practiced it in, uh, on the practice field and you've gone through it. And now you have more confidence because you've got a couple games under you. You've got more understanding and mental fortitude because you've got a couple games under you. And you're just in the flat out rhythm of playing that all that stuff just starts to build momentum. And offensive line play is continually building momentum throughout the season. You know, it's as we saw with Notre Dame's offensive line last year, it's building on every game to be better than the game before. And if, if that's what you can accomplish, I think you've had a very successful season. The guys who do that the best get to hold up the Joe Moore award at the end of the year, which is something that is unbelievably coveted and respected across the country. So it's, it's just really getting an understanding of how do we want to play together? Those guys know how to play together and can play together, but there's a style that also comes with that. And once you figure out your identity and get a couple of games underneath your belt, all that does is build the momentum going forward. All right. So, so take me through it a bit. Say we're running like duo, right? Just a pretty, like that was Notre Dame's favorite run concept last season, right? <laughs> if you line up at the line of scrimmage, how much communication is going on pre-snap? And are you aware of every single person on the line, on the offensive line, who they're getting, like who they're reaching to in the second level, like who's getting the linebacker, all that? Yeah. I, well, first of all, um, the communication is constant. And like, if you've got a quiet offensive line, you probably don't have a great offensive line <laughs> if I'm being honest. Um, and that all stems from the center, just understanding what's the defense set up. Where's the mic? Uh, what do we want to call, et cetera, et cetera. Then from that, depending on duo, if it's uh, a stretch play, if it's a zone, if it's a counter, understanding what your assignment is, if you have to work in tandem on a, a double team reach with some guy. And then that also just extends to communication, just saying, always talking, always talking and whatnot. I wouldn't say you're always being considerate of what every single guy is doing, but you always have an understanding of the concept of the play. So you understand which yeah. guys aren't yours. <laughs> like Harry, yeah. if, if Harry taught anything, he taught you which guys you're not supposed to block <laughs> just as well as he taught you which guys you are supposed to block. Because if you block the wrong guy and leave a guy go free, that's about as disastrous as giving up a sack. So, yeah. That makes sense. And it's interesting that it's all led by the center. And then you think about what Notre Dame did last season, moving Jared yeah. Patterson, who is one of the best centers over the left guard. And then that way Zeke Corral could play his natural position at center. How'd you think he did last year? Zeke or uh, Zeke? Jared. Zeke. I think Zeke did great. Um, again, this is, I, I'm glad to see him get those reps because he's going to be the guy going forward, at least from what we can tell. And that's, that's experience that you can't get anywhere else. Uh, game experience is just a whole different ball game. Like I said earlier, you can go on the practice field and take however many reps with your quarterback, making sure that the snap is perfect. But until you get out there and see it, it's just never going to be the same. I thought Zeke did a great job of stepping up, understanding uh, that he needed to be the guy. And he had the trust of his players, of the rest of that offensive line, which is insurmountable. And it, Huge credit to Jarrett, again, in a similar yeah. way with Blake. That's such a selfless move and just such a betterment of the team type of mentality that if if you think Zeke and Jarrett weren't in the film room every Sunday talking about that stuff together, if you think Jarrett wasn't giving him the absolute brain dump of how he was reading it, and, and this is also to say if you think Jarrett wasn't out there being kind of a center position himself – and helping set the defense, yeah. you'd be sorely mistaken. Sure. But I, again, I think it's absolutely imperative that Zeke did get those reps going into this season. And, you know, he's got that experience under his belt. Yeah, I think Zeke is is poised to have a big year here in his fifth year. But I, I want to get to the fun stuff now. So <laughs> this time of year, the guys in the team are in the middle of Matt Bayless's winter workout program. And I think the fan base is a pretty good understanding that Bayless is really good at his job and the workouts are extremely difficult. Bayless, of course, is the head strength and conditioning coach, director of football performance at Notre Dame. But could you just take me through how physically demanding like one of his workouts is so we could get a better standing of what those guys are going through now? I have somewhat of a glimpse of it. I remember back in college seeing you the day of a workout and you were deceased <laughs> by like nine 30, but just take me through it, man. Like, what's it like? It's, um, it's hell on earth, uh, like flat out. Um, but 
it's the it's the most fun thing I've done in my life that I would never want to do again and never wish upon my worst enemy. Fun how? And in, in the sense that, so, uh, you know, first, I, I was in that first class that Bayless came in. The first year Bayless was there was my senior year. And we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into. We heard all these stories from, you know, guys had some friends at UConn where Bayless was before who we heard some stories from the pipeline, like, y'all better buckle up. Like, you know, like right. Matt is coming, man. Right. And, yeah. And he gets there. And one of the first lifts that we had that year was, um, I'm sure that they just had it. Um, they had, we had the St. Valentine's day massacre. Yeah. And, they did. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that video. Yeah. And it's all about the reason that I say it's fun is because you're in there miserable. You're doing stuff that you didn't think you could put your body through. You're doing reps that you didn't know that you had into. And you look across the room and you see the other guy just absolutely in a world of pain with you. And you see him going through it and you guys can't just help but smile and just kind of be like, dude, what the hell is this? (laughs) And like, once you guys can get over that, it's like, all right, we're in this together. Let's, let's just keep pushing through it. And you know, the St. Valentine's day massacre, um, just kind of is a concept is all about love and it's all about for your brother. So everybody's paired with one guy and you're doing the entire workout with one other guy and it's your responsibility to get him through it and it's his responsibility to get you through it. So it just absolutely builds this beyond immeasurable bond with the guys on that team. But at the same time, it's, it's the least fun you could ever have working out. Cause you, like I said, you're doing things and especially that first year when we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into, I, you know, I didn't realize necessarily I could put my body through those things and still come through on the other side. (laughs) It was, it was out of control. You got a best Matt Bayless story you could share with us. I do uh, actually. And I've shared this one with you um, as well, but for your new podcast listeners, um, there's a very dear friend to both Tyler and I, who goes by the name of Logan plants. Um, and during I, we were doing our liftathon, um, which, you know, <laughs> yeah, and it was, fun. well, we would get people to sponsor, um, reps of leg press. So they'll say, all right, I'll give you 10 bucks for every leg press that you do. And we're giving it all back to charity and we're, we're just putting it all back. And Logan's over there. I'm on the other side of the weight room. Logan's in another group from me. So we're just kind of like rotating through and I'm like, directly across the weight room from him and like you just kind of like hear this commotion start going on over on the leg press racks and it's like what's what's happening over there and I look over Logan's just absolutely gritting out these leg (laughs) press and like Bayless had said he's like all right guys like I want to make sure we don't over kill our legs so nobody go more than 50 Nobody go more than 50 leg presses. And has he got like maxed out weight? Logan has he can get? Logan has seven plates on either side of the leg press. So 14 total 45 pound plates. And he's just going, dude. And Bayless comes over and he's loving it. Logan <laughs> is bright pink red and is screaming just incoherent nonsense. Just going to Bayless like gets down flips his hat around and is like full on headbutting Logan <laughs> in the chest. Like as he's doing it. And like, for those who don't know, sorry, I'll put my hat around. That was ridiculous. I hope um, people uh, that are watching this on YouTube are enjoying it. That was yeah. Great. I hope you guys are loving this. Um, <laughs> but like, so Bayless's big line is show me. Like he loves yelling, show me as like, just like to get you going, like show me what you got. And so he's just got his head buried in Logan's chest going like, show me Logan, show me Logie. <laughs> and he's like, I got you, coach. I got you, coach. And like, finally, like, Logan takes a break. And Bayless is like, Hey, how many was that? And Logan shouted out something like 73 or something <laughs> like that. And I've never, I don't think I've ever seen like Coach Bayless that concerned for another person, like in the weight room where he's like, Oh my God, we got to cut him off. We got to cut him off. <laughs> and sure as hell, they cut him off. Logan gets up and just like starts running around the weight room going crazy. Bayless is going nuts, but. I mean, that's that's about as energetic as I have ever seen the weight room 
in my entire life. And it's something I'll never forget from coach Bayless. Just dude, I don't know how many hundreds of pounds <clears throat> hitting him in the <laughs> chest, man. It's nuts. What's up with his voice? Does he smoke like a pack of cigarettes a day? Or is that just when you become a strength and conditioning coach, your voice just has to deepen that much. So I think it's, I think there are a select few coaches around the world who are just gifted with football voices. And it's like yeah. coach Bayless is one. Um, I had the absolute honor of playing high school football for Bruce Rollinson at modern day high school, um, who has one of the greatest football voices in the entire world for any listener listening in who wants to know what I'm talking about. Just Google a Bruce Rollinson halftime speech and you'll understand it. But he, he he's, he's not a smoker. Uh, he's not a drinker from what I, from what I see. And I think it's just the passion. Every time you hear him talk, it, it almost looks like he's about to just like burst full of emotion and whatnot. And it comes out so passionately. I don't think he knows any other way to convey himself. I think that at these strength and conditioning coach clinics that these guys go to, you kind of reach a certain level and then they all just come together and be like, we got to do something about your voice. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what it is. I think there's a secret society within strength and conditioning coaches out there. And they're like, look, we got to voice train you. It's you have way too much. I don't even know. It's, too high of a pitch we got to bring just, that down yeah just a full-on intervention at that point That's <laughs> yeah so congratulations good. man you made it to this point we got to totally change your voice yeah but sam this has been great man thank you so much for joining us here uh be well let's do this again soon all right yeah man thank you so much go irish uh long live the wapu nation and always appreciate talking a little ball with you man that's a wrap for today. Thanks again to Sam Bush for coming on the show, and thank you for making us your first listen today and every day. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe if you're listening to the pod, and if you're watching on YouTube, throw this video a like and subscribe to the channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Irish or on Instagram, at Pod, or my personal Twitter, at Tyler Wojak. For your second listen, go check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball. Experts Isaac Shade and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court before we get to the madness of March. Plus, hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape, all on Locked On College Basketball. Available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. I'll see you guys tomorrow.